We saw that there are different uh, attachment styles and that they represent a consistent way with which we relate to other people, but also how we relate to other people in moments of fear, of moments of anxiety. This is what we've seen so far. However, the importance of attachment theory doesn't, doesn't really stop there. Uh, one of the most important things for us who work with mental health is precisely the fact that attachment theory has clinical implications, we say, meaning that it has implications for mental health. For psychoanalysis particularly, mental health, mental illness, mental disorder, all these concepts are concepts that we call developmental, meaning that there is not one moment in anyone's life in which a pathology, an illness, a mental health problem just appears. There might be an exception there for post-traumatic stress disorder that actually needs a very traumatic event to occur in a, in a discrete moment in time. But however, regularly, we are going to see mental illness as something that develops with time that we can find certain moments during early life and later in development that will be contributing to a later problem, to a later disease, or to a later well-being as well. So with time and with the development of, for example, uh, techniques to see the brain working and developing itself, we have discovered that this developmental way of seeing mental health is actually the way that it happens in our brains. If we see, start seeing brains of children at different ages and then through adolescence and through adulthood, we're going to actually realize that there are many, let's say, seeds that might be planted really early in our brain that later they're going to become a problem of mental health, for example. The development of, of the brain itself, it is regulated by genetic programming. It's very important that we know that we have genes that are timing the different stages of brain development. But there is a special thing that happens with the brain. If we take into account that genetic programming of the development of any other organ, there is a genetic programming that will actually make our brain what we call experience expectant. So the genetic programming says at this point of life, we need to have as brain this kind of experience in order to continue with development. So development is, the, the development of the brain is experience expectant. It expects some kind of experience in order to develop itself, but also is experience dependent. So if that experience doesn't exist, even if one has this um, genetic script or programming, that development is not going to be carried out completely or in an ideal way. So it means that we have experience and genetic script as very important and interrelated. This is a thing that is basically unique to our brain. It does happen that the brain has sensitive periods, we call it, or critical periods, moments of life in which the development of the brain goes through a radical change uh, and that it needs a lot of experience, etc. And we can already uh, guess which are these critical periods, which basically go from a birth to the end of adolescence, or actually the end of adolescence for the brain is something around 27 years old. Our brain, it's born, it's really big, as I was saying in, in, a, in a previous video, and then it becomes even bigger until six months it keeps getting bigger bigger until we hit four two years of age and then it starts pruning a little bit so pruning i mean this big big brain starts eliminating parts of itself that show that they were not that useful so around six years old we start pruning pruning connections in the brain it becomes a bit smaller but then there is a second moment of um of brain development during the beginning of adolescence that also makes it really big. We start creating more parts of the brain. If we think about it, 
the experiences that we, we have when we are two years old and when we are 14 years old are quite different. So our brain is kind of growing in order to, um, to add those experiences to our brain. And the same pruning happens by the end of adolescence, in which we decide, I mean, our brain decides to keep or not certain bits, certain connections of itself, because they become um, not that useful. When the brain is doing this, the experience we actually are having is what attachment theory describes. This is the kind of experience that the brain expects. So attachment is the experience that we're going to have that will facilitate or hinder, depending if it's good or bad attachment, the development of this brain. Because the function of attachments are physical survival, so very basic protection of life uh, and brain development, emotional survival, so that we start feeling lovable, that we are interesting, that the world is interesting, so we can turn to it and explore. And also it teaches our brain stress regulation, so being able to tolerate our own mental states and the mental states of other people. Attachment will, as an experience, will ensure cognitive survival, so meaning that several functions of the brain that are basically for processing information will be, again, well developed or hindered in their develop according to how good attachment is. And I'm referring to um, functions like attention or focus, social skills, trust, the capacity for curiosity, the capacity for exploring, the capacity for learning, for engagement with learning, for motivation with learning, etc. So all these things that actually for the brain are not that emotional, that we think that attachment might be only emotional. Actually, this very cognitive or information processing part of the brain are also, uh, they will benefit from, for, from a secure attachment. What is the importance of the early relationship for clinical psychology, for um, mental health and mental disease? From very early on, and we know this from the videos that we saw on infant attachment and childhood attachment, from very early on we will set a course on the development of the brain. From very early on we get this basis on which the brain is going to keep developing. And if the conditions remain not healthy in the sense of the relationships in my first years of life are not sensitive, are not responding well, or they are frankly traumatizing and maltreating, we will see that, for example, we could very early on, by looking at what kind of attachment children have developed, we could predict, for example, that the person later on will have depression or will have borderline personality disorder and other personality disorders. Also, we can predict, according to the quality of attachment, how persistent depression is going to be. Depression is normally a disease that, an illness that appears as an episode and then kind of goes away and then reappears again sometime after. And how many times this happens will be predicted by the quality of attachment, if it's secure or insecure. Now, when depression, for example, appears and then goes away, it doesn't go away completely in other people. Some people don't have the diagnosis anymore, but they still feel a bit down or they have problems with concentration. Those symptoms that stay between episodes are going to be worse if attachment is insecure. People will have to use more antidepressants, for example. People with depression and an insecure attachment will have to use more antidepressants and for longer. Um, they will be more at risk of committing suicide, for example. Clinically, it's important to know how a person relates, not only because of the kind of work we're going to do in psychotherapy, which is a topic for another video, because, but because attachment, security or insecurity, will set a pathway of risk, a pathway that will tell us, you know, this person has this kind of attachment, so they are at risk of being more depressed or being more suicidal, etc., etc. It follows from there that trying to modify attachment and to make it a bit more secure will have then 
clinical consequences. People who are going to have more success in psychotherapy, people who are going to be able to use better their environment, especially if it's a good environment. Also, attachment uh, predicts things that are not necessarily, for example, super related to mental health, but that they are in the way of mental health. So concepts, for example, that have to do with well-being in general. One example that comes to mind right now is the example of acculturation. Acculturation is when we have, for example, uh, we move from one cult culture to another one and we need to kind of acquire that culture. And the fastest we do acquire it, the better we can function in that culture. And better functioning in that culture means that you know, you get better jobs or uh, you get more friends and things that actually are going to be then predicting in turn how mentally healthy you will be. If, if we are cultured well, we're going to be healthier mentally, but also we'll have less obesity, uh, less sleep disturbances, uh, less substance use, etc. What does this have to do with uh, attachment at all? Adolescents that recently immigrated into the US, uh, and these are people who've been more or less two years in, in this new culture. Attachment, the capacity of having a secure attachment, actually predicts how well I am going to acculturate myself to this new environment, which, as I was telling you, had to do with uh, mental health, obesity, sleep disturbances, suicide, and a series of well-being outcomes that are predicted by attachment, secure attachment. That means that a way to relate to people has been flexible enough for us to change it if it's necessary. When attachment is not healthy, it's not because it's insecure, it's because it's frozen in one style of relating, because we cannot relate in another way. We either push people away or we pull them too much in. But secure attachment, the healthy one, is the one not that always has a healthy way of responding. It's the one that always has a way of responding that is different and that responds to the changes on the in the environment.